Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome everyone and thank you for attending this lecture at uh, the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies. Uh, that will be presented by uh, Professor Kent E. Calder. I will start by introducing uh, Professor Kent. Uh, currently, he serves as uh, the Vice Dean for Faculty Affairs and International Research Cooperation at John Hopkins University. Uh, he is also the director of the Edwin O. Reichweier Center for East Asian Studies. Uh, Professor Kent is an expert on East Asian political economy, energy, and geopolitics. Uh, he has served as a special advisor to the U.S. Ambassador to Japan back in 2003. Uh, Professor Kent also uh, taught and teaches at Princeton University and Harvard. Uh, he's uh, widely read and uh, published a uh, uh, number of books. Uh, today's lecture is going to be uh, uh, about one of his books, uh, which is its title is The Supercontinent, The, Lo uh, the Logic of Eurasian Integration. Uh, among his books that he has published recently, uh, there is the Circle of Compensations, Economic Growth and the Globalization of Japan, Another book, Singapore, Smart City, Smart State, Asia in Washington, and uh, The New Continents, en Energy, the 21st Century, and Eurasian Geopolitics. Uh, before, uh, before I hand it to uh, Professor Kent, I would like to uh, uh, welcome you all again. And uh, it's going to be a 45 minutes uh, presentation. Afterwards, we will have around 15 to 20 minutes uh, Q&A. Uh, Thank you all again for coming. Please, you can from here. Then. Thank you very much, Yusuf. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. Uh, from the days that I was a college student, I had a tremendous admiration for uh, King Faisal. Actually, he was the was king of Saudi Arabia during the days when I was in college. And as an intellectual, as someone who could foresee the future, who acted boldly at certain times. Sometimes it was ways that made life difficult for the United States. But nevertheless, uh, in terms of the interests of Saudi Arabia, um, a, a man of vision. And uh, it's an honor to be here at the center uh, that's uh, established in his memory. Uh, I. I've, this is our first uh, trip to Saudi Arabia. My wife Toshko is here as well. Um, but I must say it's been a memorable one. Uh, the hospi hospitality that people have shown uh, has been wonderful. It's been wonderful to see old friends. Uh, M Mr. Magleby, for example, was a colleague at uh, U.S. Embassy Tokyo, assistant to Ambassador Mondale. Uh, many years ago. It's good to see him and uh, f friends from the Japanese embassy and elsewhere, but particularly, as I say, at this rather important uh, time, it seems to me, in the history, in the relationship of Saudi Arabia and the world with uh, the G20 uh, coming up uh, this next year. And of course, uh, Saudi Arabia will be the host country. And it's especially interesting for me at a time like this because I'm a Japan specialist. And uh, I was in, in Osaka a few months ago. Several others were, actually. I know they're um, involved in more directly, but I certainly uh, seen, saw the preparations for the G20 and a sense for what it meant from a global point of view. And this is going to be an important, and I know many of the people involved with the T20 uh, think tank uh, preparations uh, that I understand also at this center you'll be involved in. So it's a wonderful time to be here. Um, my, what I'd like to t do today is to talk about uh, my latest book, which uh, was actually just reviewed yesterday in foreign affairs. Um, some of you may have 
a copy of the review that Andrew Nathan of Columbia University did uh, for that. So it hasn't been out long. It's only been out about uh, two months or so. Um, but I think it represents an issue uh, which we will see with uh, increasing uh, intensity uh, in coming years, namely uh, the deepening interdependent uh, interaction, let me put it that way. I am not saying here that Eurasia in some sense is becoming any, a, a cohesive entity uh, anytime soon, but certainly the deepening interaction um, that's occurring across the continent. Um, beginning in the story that I tell, uh, which I told in part in an earlier book, also The New Continentalism, which was published in May of 2012, about 18 months before the Belt and Road Initiative was announced by President Xi Jinping. Is, so it's something that I've been looking at with a lot of interest since, particularly since the uh, financial crisis of 2008 which I think is the phenomenon that began to deepen a phenomenon whose structural basis lies back uh, in two, particularly two important critical junctures. Um, the Chinese modernizations beginning in the fall of 1978 and then the collapse of the Soviet Union at the end of 1991. But it's a much larger story. I think the story that we see today that relates to so many current uh, matters of international affairs, including the US-China uh, trade conflict, the uh, interactions across the continent, uh, the look east policies of several nations, including the deepening ties that, of course, Saudi Arabia itself has had uh, with Northeast Asia, with, with Japan, with China, with other key nations, really um, has rather deep roots. And I think to understand the future of this, these relationships, one has to look back to have a sense for geography and a sense for fun. Uh, it might well be, as Tom Friedman has said, that. Uh, um, the, the world is flat in certain ways and that geography doesn't matter anymore and uh, telecommunications of course and so on the internet can put us in close relations with others very very rapidly but in a fundamental sense in this book and in a lot of my own research I do believe that geography does continue to matter, not in a static way, not in the same way, for example, that Halford Mackinder uh, was uh, arguing in the uh, beginning of the 20th century, the heartland and the rimland and those relationships. Uh, you know, geography itself has a logic, but it's transformed by economics and politics over time and by even by social relations. And I think that we have to be conscious of those uh, dimensions of geography as well. Now, that's sort of a long-winded way of getting, beginning to get into the book itself. And I'd like to just briefly uh, summarize for you what I'm trying to say. I think it does have one last prefatory word. I do think the implications are large. They affect the sort of world in which uh, uh, Donald Trump is in a, uh, interacting uh, with China. They affect uh, the way that the G20 is configured in its meaning, broader meaning, uh, for the world. Um, it affects the way that energy markets are evolving. Um, so I think the implications are large and hopefully we can have a discussion of that um, at the end. But let me just succinctly try to uh, explain a few of the key points that I'm trying to make. Um, the first one that I alluded to already is that um, geography matters. 
And how does it matter? Again, the argument is often made. These days, the world's flat, you know, telecommunications, we communicate around the world immediately. What difference does, and how does geography matter? Um, natural resources is obviously the first uh, dimension. Uh, the resources of the world, uh, beginning with petroleum, of course, lie in particular parts of the world, and they can't, they don't move around, no matter how flat uh, the world happens to be. Uh, resource complementarities are uh, also, uh, they're related to a, a broader human uh, dimension of dem demography, but the the resources concentrated in one area. Populations also have a particular uh, configuration. The fact that the continent of Asia, the continent of Eurasia has over half of the population of the world uh, is another important uh, data point. And, and that population is located in particular parts of the world, with China and India, of course, being the largest of those countries. Um, now, uh, geography also matters with respect to transportation and some kinds of communication. And I think I should elaborate. Obviously, it takes time to go from one place to another. And area uh, locations that are long ways away take, uh, it's hard, it takes more time and um, to get there. Um, and the same thing is true for trade, of course. It isn't quite as simple as that, though. Of course, there, there's a logistical dimension that I'll get into later. What sort, how do you get from road to rail to air? Um, how much does it cost to do that? Um, what kind of you know, border formalities and so on exist? And as you'll see, I, I do believe that there have been some revolutionary changes in that respect. That make geography meaningful in new ways than it has been in the past. Um, now, communication obviously transforms geography as well. If through communication we can communicate interactively very rapidly, it becomes easier to coordinate even over long distances. As I'll begin, you'll begin to see, I do think that this creates um, some considerable possibility to uh, coordinate long distance uh, supply chains uh, across continents and so on. And uh, this phenomenon, of course, is one of the main uh, developments that we've seen recently. So if um, geography matters generally, what about conti uh, continents? We really haven't thought much. Uh, there have been times in history that the concept of a continent being important has, has come up. Um, in American history, or the history of North America in the 19th and 20th centuries, the idea of um, North American continentalism or manifest destiny across the continent was relatively prominent. Uh, the concept of Europe, of course, from time to time as, a, as an entity itself, an economic entity, a, a cultural entity, Pan-Africanism, the idea that Africa, in a sense, was an important, coherent entity. Uh, well, Pan-Arabism, or the, the notion of the Arab countries having some sort of common uh, um, uh, destiny. Um, so. Contiguous land does matter strategically, psychologically, and economically for certain reasons. Um, land um, connects oceans. And then continental scale matters as well. I think this is an, is an important uh, consideration that we shouldn't forget. Now, this leads me uh, to what I think is a, a very important aspect of uh, the notion of what I would like to discuss today. Um, Zbig Brzezinski, uh, who was National Security Advisor in the United States, was also for many years one of our faculty members. And we had a, a, a seminar, a faculty seminar, in which we met with Brzezinski usually about 
five or six uh, times a year, which was quite fascinating and, and has influenced me. Um, Brzezinski said, cumulatively, Eurasia's power vastly overshadows America's. If you, I mean, of course, this is a particular dimensions of power. If you're talking about technology, it might be different, but in terms of land mass, in terms of a scale of uh, energy resources and so on, um, certainly there is that aspect. Uh, fortunately for America, Eurasia is too big to be uh, politically won. So this is really the question. Eurasia is a huge continent. Um, to what degree does it have uh, internal cohesion? And of across history, of course, uh, it's been a very rare thing for that to be the case. There's been a few periods, the Mongol Empire, uh, for example, in some respects under col colonial rule, major part parts uh, were unified under the British Empire and so on. But generally, um, Eurasia has uh, generally been deeply fragmented until I would say the late 1970s, that was very true. Um, now, that leads to the things I'm talking about. First of all, um, across land, the distance across land is geographically considerably shorter than by sea, um, as you can see. Um, that said, of course, uh, traveling by land generally is economically um, much more expensive. And, uh, traveling by sea or, or carrying um, commerce by sea and so on is much cheaper, generally speaking. But of course, the further into the continent you get, the closer, the more, ex the more advantages the uh, cross, cross land transportation has. Um, the continent of Europe, and I'll get more into this later, has actually moved since the reunification of Germany in the 1970s and well after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 particularly significantly uh, to the east. Conversely, um, economic development in China uh, since Xi, uh, Zhang Zemin's um, modernization uh, look west policies in 1999 has moved further to the to the west china is very central in this overall equation um, i it, china isn't everything but china is a significant uh, portion of the total um, and i think this map shows it two thirds of the distance between beijing and the Strait of Hormuz, as you can see, two-thirds of the distance is inside China. Um, half of the distance between Shanghai and the border of the Schengen of the European uh, Union is also inside China. So the things that China does for its own reasons domestically have a much broader catalytic impact on the region as a whole. Um, now, uh, maybe that, that's the key, one key point that I want to make. Of course, China and Russia have a series of, they have a particular geographic position that makes um, access to the seas quite difficult for them. So there's, this, there's more of a logic for them in terms of internal uh, communication across the continent. India on the continent is in a difficult position. Um, as you can see, well, see for the Chinese, across the continent is relatively easy. For the Indians, they have a, tr uh, Iran is extremely important in geoeconomic terms. And I think uh, sometimes that's forgotten. It's something, of course, worthwhile for Saudi Arabia uh, to realize as well, but of course India is also very close to Saudi Arabia. Um, energy, of course. This is one of the key elements of the deepening uh, integration of Eurasia. 
here in Saudi Arabia, the sea lanes, which developed first and very importantly with Japan, of course, and for some countries such as the UAE, J uh, Japan still is their largest um, customer. For Saudi Arabia now, China is uh, a bit larger. Um, but these sea lanes here are important. There are also other overland routes for energy. Uh, logistics. There has been some very big changes because of digitalization in uh, uh, transportation across the continent. Uh, if you go from river to rail to road and back and forth, um, if you can use computers to reduce your costs, uh, there's, it's quite an important, uh, it has an important cost effect. Finance. Another thing which happened recently, of course, is that uh, the development banks um, have, and particularly the Chinese, have made several initiatives that increase the amount of funding for infrastructure development. Under Belt and Road, for example, a lot of this developed. Um, a lot of Chinese corporations have been, become quite central in uh, the process of regional continental integration. On the seas, for example, Costco. Costco is now the third largest uh, shipping company in the world. Maersk, of course, from uh, uh, Europe is, is number one. Um, Non-American shipping companies are not very large uh, globally, but Costco has been getting bigger and bigger. They have made some strategic acquisitions, the port of Piraeus in Greece, uh, Hamban Toda in um, Colombo, uh, Sri Lanka, for example. Um, on, so on the oceans, Costco, on the land and railways, China has the largest uh, railway corporation in the world. Um, rolling stock manufacturing, China is the largest manufacturer of rolling stock. We know we a lot about Huawei, uh, the Chinese telecommunications company. We certainly see a, a lot of them around here. And as you know, this has become something of a uh, geoeconomic issue as well. Um, Alibaba, the e-commerce company, is arguably, together with Amazon, the largest uh, e-commerce company in the world. So. Um, Later in the book, I look at how these underlying <coughs> dynamics, finance, logistics, transportation, that are building, bringing the continent closer together, how they work in different regions of the world. In Southeast Asia, for example, um, uh, the railway from, uh, from Kunming down towards Singapore, there have been problems. You've heard about what's happening in Malaysia, for example, bad debt problems. Uh, but the um, infrastructure is developing uh, fairly rapidly. Uh, Russia, and one, another important aspect, I think, of what's happening across the continent is what's happening to Russia. Um, the Russian economy, ever since the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, has been relatively stagnant. And of course, uh, since the Ukraine uh, crisis of 2014, there's been major sanctions against Russia as well. And the price of oil, of course, has not been so high. So for various reasons, Russia's economy, uh, which is highly dependent on energy, as you know, has been stagnating even as the Chinese economy has been growing explosively. In 1992, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the Russia, uh, the Soviet, well, the Russian economy was larger than that of China. And today, in nominal terms, it's about one-sixth the size of China. So there's a huge uh, transformation in the relationship of uh, China and uh, Russia uh, that I think is really of geopolitical importance 
particularly also in opening the way for deepening ties across the continent between China and uh, parts of Europe, not all of Europe, but particularly from Central Europe to the East, many of the countries that historically were close uh, to China anyway during the socialist years. Um, here's this, uh, you know, showing what has happened um, to the economic scale of Russia, of China, as opposed to Russia. Um, Europe, and this is one of my main points, and I'll, I'm interested in the reaction that um, I'm beginning to get uh, from both in the United States and Europe. Um, I think there's an important transformation which has occurred in Europe since the end of the Cold War um, that at least I as an American who specializes in on East Asia was really not aware of until I began to get into this book. But I think it's quite important for global uh, geopolitics, this transformation that's been occurring. Um, basically, um, this is the membership, membership in the European Union. Of course, it started with the core nations here on the <laughs> continent in the West included, it brought in Britain and Ireland and uh, Denmark fairly early on, and then expanded into uh, the Mediterranean before the end of the Cold War. But then what happened after that, I think, is really what's interesting and important. All of these nations in the East, including three countries that were former republics of the Soviet Union, uh, joined um, what, they joined NATO and also uh, most of them into the European Union, most of them also with the common currency. And so um, what implications does this expansion of the European Union have for the broader uh, geoeconomics and politics of, East, of, of Eurasia as a whole? This is a question I go into in some detail. Now, I'm not arguing, and there's been a lot of discussion of this. I'm certainly one of our uh, research, core researchers um, is from the German Council on Foreign Relations, and um, I have friends with Free University of Berlin and so on who were involved in our research earlier on. I, I certainly appreciate, or in Britain, for example, a lot of people concerned about the human rights situation in um, parts of China or the, um, you know, the debt difficulties and so on. And I don't want to uh, depreciate those. And particularly in the western part of the continent, it seems to me, if you're talking about Britain, if you're talking about the, perhaps the French in certain ways, the Scandinavians, of course, have been very concerned about uh, human rights questions and so on. But in the center of Europe and to the east, it seems to me there's a rather different uh, dimension. And since the European Union operates on the basis of a consensus uh, decision making, uh, it becomes difficult to respond as an institution to some of the deepening inter inter economic interdependence across the continent. Now, what does this lead to? Um, the traditional system of global governance that we have had, it seems to me, is what I would call a regulatory system uh, that has a set of rules. And the, you know, and it's relatively objective and countries observe them or they don't observe them. Obviously, almost any country uh, you know, fails to observe the rules in some cases. But it's a system that is rule-based. Uh, that's been the tradition in the major uh, industrialized nations and uh, with developing countries involved in this as well, um, really ever since the early post-war period. Uh, now, there are other possibilities. 
One historically, and Henry Kissinger looked at this particular variant in great, in considerable detail in his PhD thesis that was about a world restored. Uh, many of you know about the Congress of Vienna uh, that did have some rules, for example, that the established uh, governments were to be uh, respected. There, you know, it was very uh, opposed to revolution and so on. And it did last for th 30 years or so, and in some ways for close to a century, uh, the concert of powers that the C uh, Congress of Vienna established. Um, so these two variants, of course, have a considerable history uh, in the West. But I also look at some of the other governance possibilities. Of course, in China, the traditional uh, tributary system was much more personalistic based on human relations and the be benevolence of the ruler and so on um, rather than a set of rules. So it was a different type of system than Bretton Woods. The one that it seems to me that we are getting, beginning to get today, or that China at least is trying to propose uh, to the world, is this distributive regionalism system, not rule-based with a, a structure of international affairs which is not unitary, but rather uh, with many uh, different sorts of powers. It, it has a, some resemblance, as you can see, to the concert of powers system, but to my mind, without very clear uh, rules, um, debt, you know, and, and it has some problems as we've seen, for example, the uh, debt uh, difficulties and so on. Um, so this is basically, so that particular system that China is presenting to the world through Belt and Road, it seems to me, is, has a particularly subduct, uh, seductive character uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't have a set of rules, both seductive and in a certain sense a dangerous character. It doesn't have a set of clear rules, but it distributes resources to the extent that it can continue just to give people roads and bridges and loans and this sort of thing um, without uh, forcing them to conform to particular rules. Um, it has an attractiveness to um, country, to many countries of the world. I think that's a fair point. Uh, that said, uh, it does create problems like, for example, the bad debt uh, problem, uh, the lack of rules, um, you know, issues, for example, such as human rights are not um, considered as major elements uh, of the system, abstractions, um, democracy, if you will, or, uh, but on the other hand, the personalistic, uh, you know, values or human relations, it, it does have a place for that sort of thing in the system. So it's a, I'm arguing really that what uh, China is doing with Belt and Road is trying to create a different, it, it's not, contradictory to a rule-based system directly. In fact, it can grow up. It's a, it's a different system which is in, ten, in tension with the traditional, uh, you know, Bretton Woods and, free, and the trade-oriented order and so on. Um, it can grow up inside that system. It could potentially even coexist with it in certain ways, but it's highly uh, seductive because it it doesn't conform to a set a particular set of rules. Uh, so I think that is the challenge that the world uh, faces right now. Now, um, what I've tried to summarize uh, what I have been uh, saying is I do think geography matters in Eurasia itself particularly the um, presence of, in certain parts of the con continent, of raw materials. Obviously, the huge uh, concentration of 
oil and gas in the Persian Gulf is one key dimension of that. And that's highly complementary with um, the huge population concentration in East Asia. Uh, the per capita demand for energy still, because many of those countries, particularly India, of course, are not terribly affluent, per capita consumption is still very, very low. And so I think there's a long ways for this phenomenon to go. At this point already, three quarters of uh, the oil that the Gulf uh, exports goes to Asia. And that share has been uh, slowly rising uh, over time. Uh, until 1993, China was a net exporter of oil. It, in 92, for example, it exported about a billion U.S. dollars a year to Japan alone. But now um, China is a massive uh, importer uh, from the Gulf to Asia. Uh, and that, um, that uh, amount is rising. Um, by 2030, um, the IEA is predicting that China will be 75 to 80 percent dependent for its oil on the outside uh, world, on imports. And with the Gulf, of course, being by far the most important uh, source. And China, by a substantial margin, will also be the largest oil importer in the world. And so one aspect of this new uh, deepening interdependence, of course, the, across the continent is certainly energy. But I also have been saying that there's a very important relationship beginning to develop between Central and Eastern Europe on the one hand and East Asia, particularly China, on the other. It doesn't have to be only China. Certainly Japan, Prime Minister Abe was recently uh, visiting uh, uh, Italy and France and several uh, countries, also uh, in the last year or so in Central Europe and so on. So I think Japan has begun uh, to play a more important role in Europe, and certainly in the context of the G7, which has just been uh, meeting. Uh, Japan has uh, it, a major role in that, a, a major way for deepening relations with Europe. Um, but the geography once again um, intervenes. The, uh, content, the relationships of the continent are across the continent, of course, are particularly easy to develop. Or the combination of uh, sea routes to places like um, um, Piraeus in Greece, or uh, recently to um, um, Trieste, for example, where China, in Italy, where China has just uh, begun to establish an, another major new port. So uh, in various ways, those relationships across the continent are deepening. Uh, China is putting out a lot of money, particularly to places like Serbia or Belarus, or uh, countries that are not in the European Union, that are on the fringe of the Union. Um, and these things are quite new. They're a product of uh, relationships that have developed since the end of the Cold War and that have accelerated since the uh, 2008 financial crisis. So that, those two elements, the energy relationships across Eurasia um, the deepening relationship of Europe and the N Northeast Asian countries are both uh, elements uh, that are uh, of this new uh, continentalism that are rising and that I think in the long run uh, have uh, geopolitical importance. I should say perhaps one word finally in conclusion about the United States. What does this mean? this situation for the United States. I think it's, of course, the United States in the end, because of uh, its technological pro prowess, its creativity, its underlying geopolitical capabilities, its food, food supply, 
uh, in some respects. And in some ways, this could be even in tension with uh, the Gulf, its energy uh, as well. The United States has, I think, some underlying uh, strengths that will continue to cause it to play a one central role in world affairs. But to attain the kind of dominance that the United States has had uh, in the past uh, two decades, maybe, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, those kind of things, or in the early post-war years, I think those things will be difficult. And one of the most important counter forces and counter pressures in world affairs, or to put it differently, challenges for the uh, nations that have had uh, common concerns in, uh, for um, global stability, a market economy, human rights, and so on, um, will be the deepening relationships across the continent. So that's sort of the heart of what I want to say. And I look forward to um, people's reactions. Thanks very much. Thank you.